handouts for chapters 4 and 5 are there, uh, so pick those up for next week. We talked a little bit about the end of chapter 1 last time and its significance, but that's where I want to begin. We've had this vision, incredible vision, revealing the glory of God, revealing His power, revealing His splendor, the magnificence of the creatures and the surface over them and on the surface the throne and above the throne one who looks like a man. But it all comes down to this was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of, God, of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell on my face and I heard the voice of someone speaking. It all comes down to speech. All comes down to God using language, our language, to reveal himself to us and to reveal his way. That's where we begin, and that's where I want to end our thinking tonight as we uh, talk about what does it mean that God chooses to speak to us? I fell on my face, and I heard a voice. Then he said to me, O oh, son of man, O oh, mortal, O oh, human, stand up on your feet, and I'll speak with you. That's interesting, isn't it? Don't just lie there. <laughs> and by the way, I enjoy saying this uh, over and over again. In the Old Testament, when you read the word worship, what the Hebrew actually says is they were on their faces. There is no word for worship in Hebrew. So when I hear in services people say, let us stand in an attitude of worship, I chuckle. Uh-uh. The attitude of worship is on your face. But he says, get up. Interesting. I don't want to speak to you as an abject worshiper. I want to speak to you face to face. I want to speak to you as another person. And so, when he spoke to me, now I happen to pick up the NRSV here this evening, and it's wrong. <coughs> It says, a lowercase spirit entered into me and set me on my feet, and I heard him speaking to me. No, <laughs> the spirit entered into me. <laughs> That's going to be the theme running through the book. The spirit, the spirit, the spirit. It shows up here in this chapter. four times. Here, two, two, excuse me, in this section, two and three. Two, two, he set me on my feet. Chapter three, verse 12, he lifted me up. Chapter three, verse 14, he lifted me up. And 324, he set me on my feet. The Holy Spirit is the one who, in a real sense, is giving Ezekiel backbone, helping him to stand up. Now that relates directly to the way it is used in the New Testament. The Greek word is parakletos. which is stand beside. And we've struggled to translate that term ever since. The King James in 1611 said, the one who strengthens with. 
And they used good Latin, com fortis, which they translated in English as comfort. And so we've gotten the idea that the Holy Spirit is the warm fuzzy. <laughs> He's the comforter. No, the Holy Spirit is the one who gets you up off the ground <laughs> and helps you to stand in the face of not only the terror of the glory of God, but what these people are going to throw at you. Now, in that light, then, I think we can look back at chapter 1, where we read in 1.12, Each one moved straight ahead wherever the Spirit would go. And again, in verse 14, no, excuse me, that's not right. Verse 20. Wherever the Spirit would go, they went. And then we have, because the Spirit of the living creatures was in them. Now, I think there's no question that chapter, excuse me, verses 12 and 20 are talking about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is moving these living creatures wherever they should go. And then we're saying, and the wheels went with them because the spirit of the living creatures was in them. Well, it could be that it is that, the same spirit that's in the living creatures is in the wheels. But I suspect that what it's really saying is the spirit that was in the living creatures not the living creature's spirit, but the spirit that was in the living creatures, was also in the wheels. I think in the context of the book, we're not talking about, well, these, uh, these creatures had a spirit, and that spirit sort of motivated. I don't think so. I think we're saying that indeed the Holy Spirit is at work. And that means then that we can say already from these first three chapters, who is the Holy Spirit? He's the one that motivates, empowers, energizes. He's the one who directs. He's the one who strengthens us for everything that we may have to face. God, the third person of the Trinity, has made himself available to us, to enable us to stand in the face of everything and enable us to know where we should go and what we should be doing. Sometimes he does this directly and we have a clear sense of him saying to us, this is what I want you to do. But I think that's not normal. I think normally, as we are totally surrendered to him, he is able to direct us without having to say, now, do that. <laughs> Here, go there. He's able simply to direct us in life, and I think that's what he wants to do. So, the Spirit entered into me, set me on my feet, and I heard him speaking to me. I think perhaps that's a fourth thing the Holy Spirit does. I've only got two here on the board. He motivates, directs, he strengthens. And I think the fourth thing is he enables us to hear God's voice. Now he says... Yes. Can we also see that the Holy Spirit can give them a means to obey? Like if I'm laying me out flat, I'm supposed to die. <laughs> That's sort of what I'm thinking about when I say motivates. 
But yeah, yeah. Son of man, I am sending you to the people of Israel, to a nation of rebels who have rebelled against me. They and their ancestors have transgressed against me to this very day. I like the Hebrew idiom there. They have transgressed against me to the bone of this day. <laughs> to this very day. Now, how many times does, do words for rebel or rebellion show up in chapter 2, verses 3 to 8? Seven times. And if you count the one that the um, uh, NRSV here translates as transgress, eight times. Uh, NIV will do it, uh, they have revolted against me. So there are three different Hebrew words being used here. The first one is marad, which appears twice in verse 3. It occurs about 25 times in the Hebrew Bible. The second one is this verb that is trans translated by the NRSV, transgressed, which appears once there in verse 3. And then the third one is mara, which appears five times in verses 4 through 8. Five times. They are a rebellious house. They are a rebellious house. Did I tell you they're a rebellious house? Did you get the point, Ezekiel? They're a rebellious house. Wow. He is trying to make a point. Now, the fascinating thing is in that first occurrence, in verse 3, I'm sending you to the people of Israel to Gentile rebels. Your translation will say a nation of rebels. But the word that is used is the word Gentiles. Boy, you talk about insult. Are they my people? No, they are Gentile rebels. Kind of a wonder to me that Ezekiel lived to write any more of his book. Now, I didn't animate this as I intended to, so I've also I've rather answered my question. But, well, no, I haven't really. I've still got the question there. How is disobedient different from rebellious? Or how is rebellious different from disobedience? All right, all right. Willful, constant disobedience. might disobey, but you're not really rejecting the authority. Okay, I, I, I'm, I'm on your side. I think both of them are rejecting authority. Rebellion is a sort of an in your face. Yes, yes. Rebellion. Exactly. It's an attitudinal thing. I'm going to do this. I don't care what you want. I don't care what you say. I'm going to do this so that it's the strongest possible statement. And the, uh, the next verse, this is NRSV, they are impudent and stubborn. The Hebrew says they are stone-faced and hard-hearted. Yes. I don't care what you want. Sort of has the jutting chin. Defiant, yes, yes. So it is speaking about an attitude. An attitude that says, I don't care what you want, I'm going to do what I want. That's what has happened in this thousand years since Moses. From standing at the foot of Mount Sinai and saying, yes, yes, we want to be your people. No, no. To the extent that 
God can say of them, they're not only not my people, they're Gentiles. They're a nation of rebels. So that what we're talking about is the end of a process, a thousand year long process. Well, no, no, God, I don't really want to do that. Do I have to do that? Well, all right. God, I know what you want, but I'm sorry, I, I can't do that. I don't care what you want. I'm going to do what I want. There's a process there, a road down which we walk till we come to this end. So Ezekiel, you need to know who you're going to be talking to here. In another place, he will say their foreheads are brass. You need to know who it is you're going to be talking to. Okay, so what is the purpose then of Ezekiel's commissioning? That's what these first three chapters are all about. They're about his commission. He says, Whether they, verse 5, whether they hear or refuse to hear, for they are a rebellious house, they will know there has been a prophet among them. What is Ezekiel commissioned to do? He's commissioned to deliver a message. Is he commissioned to be successful? No. He says that's what you need to know right here from the outset. Whether they listen to you or whether they don't, and remember they are rebellious people. So, Well, if the odds are that they're not going to listen to you, why bother? Okay. And we're going to see that very clearly next week. Yeah, I don't think we see that here, though. I don't think we see. John, you were going to say something. Okay. <laughs> I, I think we can imply that. I don't think the text says that. What does that fifth verse say? They will know... There has been a prophet. Now we're not told what the implications of that statement are. But I suggest to you it's this. God gives this information in advance. Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. No ifs, no ands, no buts. Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. Their response is, are you nuts? Jerusalem can't be destroyed. It's God's holy city. 
Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. When it is destroyed, what will they know? God's word is true. And it's not the Babylonians that did this. It's God who did it. This is one of the chief purposes of prophecy. That when the predicted thing happens, we realize God knew this in advance. God did it. God is responsible. So whether they listen to you or not, eight years from now, they're going to know there was a prophet in their midst. God doesn't give us prediction in order that we can create a timetable. But he gives us prediction so that when it happens, number one, we know that he is in charge of history, and number two, our faith is strengthened because we know he can be depended on. So, Ezekiel, I'm not commissioning you to change their hearts. Boy, that's hard. I'm not commissioning you for them to approve of you. I'm commissioning you to be that living example of obedience and to declare this word in such a way that when it happens, they will know there is a God, a God who knows the future, and a God who rules history. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. 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 Oh, I, I absolutely, absolutely. This is this is getting him ready <laughs> for what's going to happen to him over the next forty years. It's not something too that, like, when your child disobeys, and then they say, "You didn't tell me." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When your child disobeys and says, "You didn't tell me." <laughs> yes, I told you. Again and again and again. And, and again, as we'll see next week, I lived it out. <clears throat> now then, so that's, that's verses 1 through um, 8. And in 8, then he begins to go a step farther. You, son of man, hear what I say to you. Do not you be rebellious like that rebellious house. <laughs> Again, you live out obedience. Open your mouth and eat what I give you. I looked and a hand was stretched out to me. Again, you sort of want to see this on instant replay. Is there just a hand in air or, or, or what? And the scroll of a book, and RSV says a written scroll, which is a reasonable translation of that, but a, a book scroll, not just, not just a roll of parchment, but a roll with writing on it. He spread it before me, and it had writing on the front and on the back. That's unusual. Normally, it would only be on the front. This has writing that's on the front and the back. Whoever was writing it had a lot to say, and they had to get it on both sides. And written on it were words of lamentation and mourning and woe. Wow. Not what you want to get under the Christmas tree. He said to me, Son of man, Eat what is offered to you. Eat this scroll and go speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth 
and he gave me the scroll to eat. He said to me, mortal, eat this scroll, son of man, eat this scroll that I give you. Fill your stomach with it. Then I ate it, and in my mouth it was as sweet as honey. Well, two questions there. What is the eating all about? And how is it that when the thing is full of lamentation, mourning, and woe, and later on he'll talk about his own bitterness of spirit, how can it be sweet? What's going on? Why eat? Internalize, yes. When you eat something, you take it into yourself and it becomes part of you, but you also are shaped by it. Now, what's going, what, what does that mean now to internalize God's word or God's message? What are we saying? It becomes a part of him. It's no longer, oh, I'm the speaker and there's the message. No. In a real sense, again, we're going to see it next week. I become the message. Long time ago, more than 60 years ago, a Jewish man named Abraham Heschel wrote a um, sort of a paradigm changing book when he talked about the pathos of God, the feeling of God. And he says what's remarkable about the Hebrew prophets is they identify with God. And what God feels, they feel. They are not merely mouthpieces. Well, God said you guys are going to get it. No. My people, I'm telling you, you cannot keep this up. You will destroy yourselves. I will destroy you. That's internalization. That's taking it into yourself and becoming part of what God is feeling and God is experiencing. Eat this. Eat this. Now, sweet? It's God's word. Yes, yes. That sense of being united with God that sense of being able to speak not merely for God, but as God. And that's one of the characteristics of Hebrew prophecy. It, they, they clean it up in English. But there are often times when, a ver in a single verse, you start out talking about God as He, and then you talk about I, <laughs> And then you talk about you. <laughs> God is spoken of in the third person and the first person and the second person all in the same verse. And it's that kind of thing that's going on. They are totally caught up in God, but they're not absorbed. They're not possessed. They are filled. And that is a absolutely crucial difference. When a person is possessed, then they lose their own character, they lose their own identity in the God, in the possessor. When they are filled, God takes on their shape. And that's what you see in the Hebrew prophets. Isaiah is not Jeremiah. Jeremiah is not Ezekiel. Each one of these retains their own identity because God isn't possessing them. God doesn't want to possess you, but he wants to fill you. And whatever shape the glass is, it'll be the same golden nectar that is filling it. That's what God wants to do. And so, yes, oh, to be 
filled with God. This God of love, this God of truth, this God of righteousness, this God of Hesed, this God of justice. Oh my! Oh my! Again, in, in many ways, the, the visual nature of the book of Ezekiel is, is just full of these kinds of visualizations rather than a, uh, an abstract discussion of what it means to be a prophet. There's this kind of picture. Eat the scroll. So he says, verse 4, Son of man, go to the house of Israel and speak my very words to them. Mm, these are not Ezekiel's words. They're God's words. They're coming through Ezekiel's mouth. They're coming through his manner of expression, but they're God's words. You are not sent to a people of obscure speech and difficult language, but to the house of Israel. Not to many peoples of obscure speech and difficult language whose words you can't understand. And then I like this. Surely if I sent you to them, they'd listen to you. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there are <coughs> modern missionaries who can testify to that. I speak to people in suburban America, and they don't hear a thing. I go to Hungary, <laughs> Japan, and maybe they don't hear very well either. But I go to, quote, darkest Africa. They fall all over you. But the house of Israel will not listen to you. And here it is. Because they are not willing to listen to me. That's a profound statement. I don't want to listen to a God to whom I might have to bow down. I don't want to listen to a God who might ask me to give up my rights. I don't want to listen to a God who has other plans for me than I have. So it's not you, Ezekiel. It's me. Because this is verse 7, and this is the one I was referring to either earlier. Because all of Israel has a brass forehead and a stony heart. I think every one of us, in our worst nightmare, needs to see ourselves in that position. Because it's possible. One step at a time, and suddenly, how did I get here? But here I am. No, one step at a time toward him. One step at a time, more faithful, more generous, more obedient, more like him. And that's part of the reason for the hymn tonight. Not to be less like you, but to be more like you. Like the hardest stone, harder than flint, <coughs> I've made your forehead. <laughs> Do not fear them or be dismayed at their looks, for they are a rebellious house. So, here it is, verse 12. The Spirit lifted me up. The glory of the Lord rose from its place. <coughs> I heard behind me the rumbling. 
It was the sound of the wings of the living creatures brushing against one another. The sound of the wheels beside them that sounded like a loud rumbling. The Spirit lifted me up and bore me away. So he's received God's commission. Now he's had sort of a reprise of the vision. And now the Spirit lifts him up and takes him away. What's going on there? Uh-huh. <laughs> yes, and, and let's tie it in now. Okay, there may be times in the future when he's not going to feel that vision <laughs> with the same clarity. I think it's also, it's remembrance. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. The glory of God. The wonder of his work. The wonder of his world. Okay. Okay. Let's leave that behind and go on to the work. Thanks for the memory. <laughs> the memory that will be there at critical moments in the future. But I can't live there. As much as I'd like to live encased in the glory, enjoying his presence, I've got to go. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yes. Like the disciples. Oh, Jesus. This is wonderful. Let's build three temples here. <laughs> and we'll just stay here and enjoy it. No. Down in the valley. There's a child who's held captive by a spirit, <laughs> and your friends can't do anything about it. Let's go. In the contrast to this, he says, of those who kill the righteous yes. and then anger the spirit. Yes, yes, yes. So, you know, there isn't the joy of living in a high one. It's literally anger the righteous. <laughs> yes, yes. He still went. He still went. He still had yeah. the spirit. Yes, yes. <laughs> yep. Yep. Possibly. Possibly. Is it toward God or is it toward the people? And I think the answer is yes. <laughs> Again, I, I think we we dare not make these people plaster saints. God, this is unfair. <laughs> Why should I have to do this and not somebody else? Nobody will like you. Yeah, yeah. I think it's that too. Much, how much of it, some of it, is the bitterness of the message. Contemplating this. Oh my goodness, they're not going to listen to me. And so he sits there, at the end of verse 15, stunned for seven days. This, this has been said, he needed time to process. I think he also needed time to say, am I really going to do this? Finally, God says, all right, <laughs> you've had seven days now. <laughs> Put it off. Yes, yes. 
So God says, let me give you an image of your calling. I have made you a watchman. So what is the watchman's role? To stand on the wall, see the enemy coming, and to warn the people. So, is it the watchman's responsibility whether the people live or die? In one way it is, but look what the text says. If I say to the wicked, this is verse 18, you will surely die, and you give them no warning or speak to warn the wicked from their wicked way in order to save their life, those wicked persons shall die for their iniquity, but their blood I will require at your hand. Oops. <laughs> Whether you tell them or not, they're going to die. But if you didn't tell them, you're responsible. Now, frankly, that sometimes makes the hair on the back of my neck stand up. We're living among people who are dying. What is God going to say to me on the last day? How many people did you let go? Now, they may not have listened to you. That's where he goes on. If you warn the wicked and they don't turn from their wickedness or from their wicked way, they will die for their iniquity. <laughs> but you will have saved your life. I think sometimes that is often a barrier to us in our witnessing. Well, they won't listen to me. And I sort of hear God saying, so? <laughs> yes. In simple language, yes. <laughs> you are responsible, and you will die with them. <laughs> Again, if the righteous turn from their righteousness and commit iniquity, and I lay a stumbling block before them, Let's talk about that a minute. <laughs> Makes you think like about Pharaoh when Pharaoh finally said, yes, I'll do this. And then God hardened his heart. I don't think this is quite as direct as that. Does God lay stumbling blocks in front of people? This text says so. <laughs> what does that mean? Get their attention. Get their attention. He said to Saul, it's hard for you to kick against the pricks, against the goads. Mm -hmm. I think, though, this in fact is going the other direction. I think this is saying the righteous person who knows what it is to be righteous has chosen iniquity. And God is going to give them something to fall over. Kind of like David. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now I say again, 
with James. God doesn't tempt anyone to do evil. No. But will God allow things to come into my life? I'm choosing the downward road. And here's this rock that if I'm not paying attention to God, I will stumble over and fall farther down the road to destruction. I've said before in the context of Pharaoh, God didn't make Pharaoh into a bad man. Pharaoh was a bad man. <laughs> He was that because his whole life, his choices had led him to this. He is a tyrant who has these, this whole people enslaved to do his will and build monuments to him. How likely is he to say, oh, you know what? I really ought to let those people go. Somewhere between zero and none. His choices have hardened his heart to the point where he can't choose anything else. Again, at my advanced age, I think about that again and again. What choices have I made during my life that make me now incapable of choosing anything else? I hope some of them have been good choices <laughs> that make me capable of making good choices now. But there it is. And I think it's the same way. God has made the world so that if you choose the downward path, there will be things in that path over which you can fall. Let's not choose the downward path. <laughs> Every choice you make leads you to another choice. Yes, yes, yes. Or does something block to also call attention to this is where you're heading and there's something else? Yes, I think so. Are the stumbling blocks for the purpose of calling attention? <clears throat> this is where you're headed. You better turn around. Yes, I think so. But this is the way the world is made. This is the way God has made the world. And we need to focus our choices in that knowledge. They shall die because you've not warned them. They'll die in their sin and their righteous deeds that they have done will not be remembered. But their blood I will require at your hand. If, however, you warn the righteous not to sin and they don't sin, they will surely live because they took warning and you will have saved your life. So what is God saying? He's saying, Ezekiel, you cannot keep sitting here. Your role, the role I've given you, is watchmen. Some of them maybe, might, possibly listen to you. But the vast majority of them will not. But your job is to warn When the end comes, they will know they have been warned. And again, maybe, maybe when the word reaches them in uh, January of 585, maybe some will say, oh, oh, oh. He warned us that this was going to happen. What had we better do in the light of that? Then the hand of God, this is verse 22, then the hand of the Lord was upon me there and he said to me, rise up, go out in the valley and there I'll speak to you. So I rose up and went out into the valley and the glory of the Lord stood there. 
And the glory of the Lord, like the glory that I'd seen by the river Kibar, and I fell on my face. <laughs> and the Spirit entered me, set me on my feet. And he spoke with me, and he said, go. Now here it comes. Shut yourself in your house. As for you, cords will be placed on you. You will be bound with them so that you cannot go out among the people. I will make your tongue cling to the roof of your mouth so that you will be speechless and unable to reprove them for they are a rebellious house. In case I hadn't told you that before. But when I speak with you, I will open your mouth and you will say to them, thus says Yahweh God. Let those who will hear, hear. Let those who hear, to re hear, refuse. For they are a rebellious house. Now what's the significance of this symbolism? Yes. Shut him up. Yes. Yes. And God's got the message. Yes. Commission to deliver a message, and it's not your message, it's my message. Yes. Yes. This is, in many ways, symbolizing everything that's been said up to this point. It reminds me of Paul in the New Testament of God saying that many were led by the Spirit of God to believe the message. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is not your business. It's not going to be accomplished through your eloquence. It's not going to be accomplished through your ingeniousness, your ingenuity. You're going to be in your house, speechless until I give you words to say. Wow. This is not about Ezekiel. It's about God. Now we can all be grateful <laughs> that this kind of a charge has not been laid on us. But the truth is still there. Do not do this in your own strength. Do not speak your words, as far as you are able, as far as you're able to discern, speak the word of God. For your words will kill. His words, in the end, will heal. Okay. Again, I intended to animate this and didn't. What about speech? Right through these two chapters, beginning there, as I said, at the very last verse of chapter 1, then through chapter 2, through chapter 3, what is it about language, about speaking, about the word? And here are some thoughts. Number one, language is vital to reveal a person. Now, we think animals com can communicate. We have a bird feeder, and it's amazing to me. The seed goes out there one day, and the next day there are 500 birds circling around it. Somebody told somebody something. <laughs> but I'm very confident that those birds don't know one another. <laughs> they don't know personality. They don't know personal characteristics. If somebody is going to know you, you've got to talk to them. And God is passionate about revealing his person to us. Language is essential for communication between persons. What are you really thinking? You've got to tell me. Now, all of us know that in marriage, there are those moments when, well, if I have to tell you, 
it's too late. <laughs> you should have figured it out. <laughs> you should have guessed it. <laughs> Maybe that works between two ladies. I don't think it works too well between a man and a lady. <laughs> if two people are to communicate, you've got to have language. Language is unique to humans. I think I've shared this story before, but it made such an impression upon me that I've told it over and over again. I suppose 30 years ago, a, a woman researcher taught a female chimpanzee American Sign Language. And the chimp learned over 200 words in sign language. I don't know any sign language, so the chimp's smarter than me. But the goal was to get the female chimp pregnant and then for her to teach her child sign language. She didn't do it. She never saw the significance of language. She could get her kid to do what was necessary without talking to it. Language is unique to us. It's inherent in the image of God. Language motivates. And language can kill and it can heal. I don't know whether you have some other thoughts there or not. We've still got a moment or two. Do you have other thoughts about language? Yes. <laughs> C.S. Lewis. Oh, C.S. Lewis. Yeah. Okay, Here's an illustration of what you've been saying. Uh, Virginia Law was the widow of Burley Law. Yes. Burley was a missionary pilot in the Congo years ago. Um, he was ultimately martyred. Uh, but I heard Virginia say that Burley, as a pilot, was doing God's work. He was transporting people in medical emergencies. But the day came when he realized that his work as a pilot was insufficient, that he had to verbalize his faith in Christ to communicate his, his life was not enough alone. And from that day forward, he began to speak the word of God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. You can't separate life and words, but life without words, what's that about? Why are you giving your life? Why are you doing this? For God's sake. Yes, Jerry. Yes. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely right. It's when God spoke things into existence. Uh, this is some of you have heard me talk about the. The issue is not similarities, the issue is differences. And you can say, well, there are pagan stories about the gods bringing the world into existence. Yeah, but none of them spoke it into existence. It emerged from their bodies. And there are all kinds of implications there. Okay, let me summarize 
what we've seen now in these first three chapters. It begins in an overwhelming vision. God is the transcendent Lord of the world. He is not limited to Judah. He is present everywhere. In Babylon and everywhere else. He and his realm, his being, are ultimately beyond words. It was like a man. It, it was like a wheel. It was like a surface. It was like a throne. It's, I got to use words, and yet words cannot ultimately convey who he is in himself. But the vision culminates in speech. Ezekiel is a speaker. That's his mission, that's his vision, that's his calling. And if he acts, as he will, again, I keep talking about next week, stay tuned, he will interpret his acts. He is to internalize the divine message. Indeed, the divine person. And he is to speak regardless of the response. He's a watchman. Interesting, we didn't talk about this, but I asked the question, what's the difference between a watchman and a pastor? The watchman is not responsible for the outcome of his message if he's faithful to deliver it. But the pastor, the pastor has the care of the sheep. He's a watchman, and he is to predict so that when the events occur, people will know it was of God. Chapters 1 to 3. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for Ezekiel. Thank you for a man who was willing to take the hard road. A man who is willing to say, Father, if that's what you want of me, then that's what I'll give. Thank you. Help us, Lord, to learn from his example. Help us in our own way, in our own situation, in our own calling, to be as deeply and fully obedient to you. Oh, deliver us, Lord. Deliver us from those small steps that end in a stone face and a hard heart. O oh God, renew in us from day to day the heart of flesh, the tender heart that says, yes, Lord, yes, yes, yes. In your name we pray, amen.